It's a hot one to do. We made short work of that one. I'm hunting in the afternoon again. I have uh, 29 geese to kill. The wind is switching and it's being flat. Imagine that. And it's hot. It's like 26 degrees Celsius. No wind. And the wind went just so flat. I mean, I'm not making excuses because I have, absolutely have no excuses to make tonight. You guys shot well tonight. You know, we're hunting out of the big bush again, no cover, so I didn't want to get caught in uh, in lay downs, you know, and it's usually more the shadows than anything else. There's just no place to hide out here. So I've got out like five bags of dive bombs, Canada specs. We're just hunting out of the willow bush. Kick the doors down when they close and hopefully rip them, you know. They're right there, go, go, go. I'm Claudio Angaro and I take people hunting. You know what to do. <laughs> they've been here for three or four days now. I know the landowner called me and said, hey, Claudio, they're in there. Go have a look at them, and I did. This morning, there was only about a 1,000 early, and then I had another hunt fall apart, and, and then we had another hunt fall apart. So I came here, and it was quite a bit bigger, and some birds that were in the other end of the field, way back there, trickled into here. Now, this is a big field, 1,800 acres. So that's always a little bit nerve-wracking because they can go absolutely anywhere. They come in and they're just a little, little high on us when they got to the tail of the decoy. So some did it right in the hole, we killed them. Some just drifted right over. Oh, enough, they're going fast. Get ready guys, let them hook. Kill them boys, kill them right there, right there. Get them, get them. Nice. Ah, the farthest dive bomb on one side is 60, 65 on the other. I just went with a big, triangle with a big hole in the middle basically and i've got a few birds way way downwind to try to get some of those geese that are coming across to start spilling air a couple hundred yards back and benelli super black eagle threes and uh you know the heavy heavy hammer number twos we're gonna time it right shit, 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 right. bone crunching go, meat go, go, tearing go lethalness nice 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 that's that if they like us we get them if they don't like us, we don't. Me and the guides are nervous every time we go on a hunt. I've been professionally outfitting and guiding hunters now for 30 years. This will be my 31st fall. You don't sleep well at night the night before. If you're hunting in the afternoon, you've got those four or five hours from the time you come back from spotting to the time where you gotta take these guys out. And there's so many things that go through your mind. Like, are they gonna come back? They don't have to come back. We hunt five million acres. There's food all over the place. It's like hunting five million acres of bait. They can go anywhere. You're always nervous. Then you get to the hunt and you go, okay, the wind's not quite the way it was this morning or when I watched them, so how are they gonna react? Are they gonna come off the roost the same way? Are they gonna react to the terrain and the land the same way? And then all these things are going through your head and then of course you have these hunters that are looking to you for direction and you have to go out there and exude the confidence and say, okay, this is the plan. This is what we're gonna do because you're the so-called expert. And why we're paranoid and why you're nervous all the time though is because you get caught in a situation where the hunt doesn't go so well and you know it could have gone better. And as you make these adjustments and you react to the birds, you go, well, I wish I'd have done that right from the beginning. That's why we're nervous. That's why we're a bundle of nerves before you take hunters hunting. And, and I can speak for probably every guide and every outfitter in North America. You still have that funny feeling in your gut before the hunt starts. Roll them, boys. Roll them, roll them, roll them, roll them. <laughs> oh, I did. You guys are too quick for me. <laughs> Gotta be quick. <laughs> that one's in the hole. That one's definitely in the hole. When you're hunting fields this big, like if you don't rip at them, those ones that are, you know, not perfect, but they're 35 yards and totally killable, like those are killable. Okay, if they come over, they come over. Guys, these are small. Go, go, shoot these, shoot these, because they're going to land somewhere else. Nice. Nice shot. Watch nice shot. One. Watch out. Nice shot. Got that one. They're killable, guys. <laughs> they drift over you. They will go somewhere else, and then they'll start pulling everything, especially on these hot, flat nights, you know, when, when there's no wind. 1,800-acre pea field. All they have to do is go down four or 500 yards away, and it's over. They'll pull everything. The common problem that we have when we're hunting waterfowl on the prairies, that's in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, any of the bigger prairie areas, there is so much food on the landscape and the birds know that and there's lots of room. And typically 
It's a little bit warmer. They're not driven to feed that heavily. They're just coming out of summer mode. They're not really there to put on the feed bags just yet. So what happens is if your rig isn't 100% perfect, they will maybe slide on you or approach high, come for a look, and then they'll go, eh, we don't like it. And it's easy, especially when you're hunting bigger flocks and on especially these afternoon or evenings or even in the early mornings when there's absolutely no wind, they're not driven to feed. What they'll do is they'll just coast over you and they might take a good look at you, 35, 40, 45 yards, but they might not close the deal right in the decoys the way you want them to. We always strive to present the birds perfectly, put the birds right in the hunter's lap. It doesn't always go that way for you. And as a guide, you have to recognize that very quickly and watch these birds. And, and in some of these bigger fields, if you let those birds drift over you and all of a sudden they start to stack up on the other end or in another field altogether, well, imagine these birds that are flying. Now you have a few hundred birds on the ground somewhere else, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred yards away creating a ruckus. That'll totally divert the fly path on, on which you are the X. Now they became the X and you don't stand a chance. What I do and what the guides will do, especially in my organization, if they're in there and we have a feeling that they're not gonna spin and do it, we're gonna go on them. And you know, you might scratch three or four or five, sometimes two, sometimes six, but what it does is it, it gets those birds rattled and rather than going down somewhere nearby, they'll blow out of there and go somewhere else. Can we get criticized for sky busting? Well, we're never shooting 60, 70, 80 yard shots, but we are taking those 35, 40, 45, and sometimes 50 yard shots overhead. And, and those are definitely within the effective range of those heavy hammer twos with an improved cylinder choke, and I can attest to that. And that's why we go on them rather than let them stack up on the other end of the field. And that's the difference between coming out of there with the 29 geese we needed and possibly two, six, or 10. Once it started, it was just, Flight after flight after flight. Uh-oh, listen, oh, yeah. Here here's the go. show, Here boys. Go get rid. These are big flights now. Oh, right, right in front, right in front. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. These ones, hang on, hang on, hang on. Get ready, get ready. They're right there, boys. Go, go, go. Nice. Two, three. <laughs> Four, five, look at that. See the delayed reaction? Good shooting, boys. See those two come down helicopter, like delayed reaction right after the last two shots? That was great. We had uh, we had one flock of Canada's come in right at the beginning, and I didn't even have the I didn't even have the cameras on. And they almost touched down downwind where I had I had a few little family groups down as far as 300 yards and and uh, they got over them and I called hard and they just kicked up like their feet were almost on the ground. They come up, banked over to the right side of us, hooked right over the middle of the blinds. And that first group of Canada's, they weren't really on their game, but uh, once I just said, guys, you know what, just treat their head like a duck. And then, you know, anything that was well within range and centered up, I called and, you know, they're shooting four or five and six out every flight, didn't take long. Okay, in the hole, guys, low in the hole, low in the hole. Just don't move, don't move, low in the hole, get ready. In the hole, in the hole, get ready, get ready, get ready. Oh shit, wait, 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 wait. Oh God, hang on, let them swing, they're not scared, they're not scared. Oh shit. Go, shoot something! Low ones, high ones. No, not You know, and, and I know I sound like a broken record on this one, but so what the hell? is a broken record. Well, when I was a little kid and well into my adult life, this is of course before the internet, before iPods, before digital music, we had these things called records. And there's a little needle on this arm on a turntable that actually spun this record around and around. And of course, because it was physical, it, they were really prone to damage. I mean, if you left them in your car in the heat and the sun, they would warp. If you pulled them out of the case, there's a little grain of sand or dust they would scratch, and there's these little fine lines on them, and then all of a sudden they would, this little needle would skip, skip. It would just say the same thing over and over again, and I know I kind of sound that way when I'm talking about the Benelli's and the dive bombs and the heavy shot and the Cabela stuff. That's the origin of a broken record. You know, when my kids were younger, I'd go, yeah, I know I sound like a broken record, and they'd kind of agree with it, and finally as they got older, they went, Dad, What's a record?
What's a broken record? You know, and, and I know I sound like a broken record, broken record, broken record on this one. I've been doing this a long, long time. And you know, you gotta have the right tools. You know, I don't push stuff just to push stuff. If there's anything better out there, I'd be using it. I mean, you know, we use the stuff so hard, like we broke a Benelli the other day, but I mean, these things get thousands of rounds fired through them. And uh, you know what, they just, they go bang all the time until there's a catastrophic failure, and then they don't go bang. You know, and then you get them fixed, and I know the Super Black Eagle 3s, they have that 10 year warranty, great peace of mind. Out front guys, out front. Oh God, just be ready, let them spin, let them spin. Okay, here we go guys. We're gonna go on these straight up. Get ready, get ready. Go, 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 up and in front, in front. Straight up. Nice shot on that one. Ah, someone smoked that one. That one. Nice. Okay guys, we better count. I have to put the best guns in our clients' hands and I'm putting the best ammo coming out of those guns and I'm hunting over the best decoys. And you, and you have to remember this, I'm not a TV show guy. I'm an outfitter with a TV show and that's a big difference. Great day though, hunters had a, had a great time. First group this morning, they went 40-40 with JMO. These guys went 40-11 and uh, we cleaned up the 29 tonight. And look what's on the deck. Look at this, we got the drone flying. We got four Canada's on final. Are you kidding me? Wow, that's beautiful. What do you think guys, good day? Good day. <laughs> Great day, great way to end it. 29 geese, that's a wrap. It was good, another perfect day. <laughs> so Steve, Steve says it's the duck hunting that's addictive, but it's actually the crystal meth we put in the food that's addictive and keeps these guys coming back every year. <laughs>